the great uh, cosmic ray mystery appears to have been solved. This is the question of where do these high energy cosmic rays that are bombarding the Earth, where do they come from? Basically, we've known about them for about 100 years, well, exactly 101 years to be precise. There was a guy called Hess who was floating around in a, in a hot air balloon and he noticed there was some radiation hitting him. He detected this radiation and it's basically very, very high energy protons. They're just coming from somewhere and they're hitting the Earth and uh, we really didn't know where they came from. It's super, super high energy. Far, far in excess of any kind of proton that's flying around the LHC, for example. So, for example, at the LHC, protons have um, around, well, when it's at full whack, which it will be once it starts up again, uh, what we call 7 TV of energy per proton, so, which is a lot. TV stands for a tera electron volts. That's 10 to the 12 electron volts. And basically, the ones that, the, the high energy cosmic rays that, were, that are coming from outer space, the highest ones have been about 300 million TV, so an awful lot more. To get a picture of how much energy is stored in, in those highest energy cosmic rays, if, if I were to like whack a tennis ball at you, Brady, at 100 miles an hour, the kind of speeds that you know the top players, like Andy Murray's of this world, are serving at, that's the kind of energy we're talking about, but it's packed into a single proton. But actually, when it comes to smacking the Earth, they, they, most of them would just pass straight through because the Earth isn't dense enough. In most cosmic rays come through the atmosphere, come past us, go through the Earth, go through the core of the Earth, yeah. come out the other side and keep going through space. Yeah, most of them will pass straight through, that's correct, yeah. yeah, they will. It's amazing. Yeah. One of the questions is, so, so why do we not know where these things are coming from? You know, they're supposed to be very sophisticated, we've known about these things for a hundred years. Now, why did we not know where they come from? The problem is, is these guys are charged. Okay, they're protons, they're charged. So charged particles get moved around in magnetic fields. And there's a lot of magnetic fields out there in the galaxy and, and beyond. So let, let's say, right, I have some crazy magnetic field going on in this room. And there's a proton sitting outside the room and it, you know, it comes through the door, it gets moved around, the magnetic field twists it all the way around and it goes smack straight into your face, Brady. Which direction did it come from? Well, I'm going to think it came from that way. Absolutely, you think it came from that way, but didn't it? It was hiding outside the room before you even started this, uh, this video. So we throw up our hands in the air and say we're never going to know? No, of course we don't do that. We find other ways to, uh, to work out where it came from. There was an idea that really dates back to a guy called Fermi. And interestingly enough, the satellite which, the, which has made the observations, which have led to the you know, discovery that was announced today, is also called the Fermi satellite. So it's a, it's a nice coincidence. But anyway, these ideas go back to Fermi. What he suggested was that when a star dies in a supernova, when a star reaches the end of its life, it runs out of fuel, it, in certain situations, it can go supernova. And, and uh, one of the things that happens with a supernova is that uh, you send out a shock wave. Okay, this very, very powerful shock wave. It basically happens because the star tries to collapse and then it gets, the collapse is sort of jolted by the neutrons in the star not wanting to be put too close together. You get this sharp, uh, sort of abrupt halt in the collapse and that causes this shock wave. We will hit the ceiling in a second. That's what a supernova is, essentially. Anyway, so you have this shock wave. So you have a situation where you have a proton, which is moving around in the magnetic field surrounding this dying star. Okay, so it's moving around the magnetic field. Every so often, it passes the shock front. When it passes that shock front, it gets a kick from the shock. Okay, it gets a kick from the shock, and it gets uh, accelerated a bit. And then it moves around a bit more, going in all higgledy-piggledy directions because of this magnetic field. Eventually, it passes the shock front again, and it picks up more, gets more of a kick, more kinetic energy. Each time, it picks up about 1% of its kinetic energy. It, it, it increases it by about 1%. So it's getting more and more and more and more energetic. Eventually, it gets so energetic that it escapes. This is the idea. that This might be the source of, um, of, of high-energy cosmic rays. So we start looking at things, objects like that, what might we see? So we're looking at, let's look at a supernova and ask what might we see? And in particular, they looked at two particular supernova. They got typical astronomers' names, which I'm not going to go into. One of them is called the Jellyfish uh, <laughs> Air Nebula, though, so that's quite, uh, at least we can remember that. They're both of the order of 5,000, 9,000 light years away, so they're faraway objects. These guys have gone supernova, so this should be, if this effect is correct, high energy cosmic rays coming from there. But we're not going to see the protons coming from there because they've moved around so much. But what we can see are photons, because photons don't move around in a magnetic field. 
Unlike cosmic rays, gamma rays travel to us straight from their sources. In particular, if you've got a proton, one of these really high energy protons, what it'll do is, if there's interstellar sort of dust around, there's you know, some interstellar gas cloud or something around this, this remnant of this supernova, when the high energy proton hits another proton that's of lower energy but sitting in this cloud, then basically what will happen is it can produce what's called a pion. If it's a neutral pion, it's just it's a combination of quarks. Okay, so it can produce this pion, and then that pion can decay into two photons, and they'll be high energy photons. And those are the things that we see, and those are the things that would come direct to us from this supernova. Now, the important point is, is that these photons that come from this process have a minimum energy. And the reason they have a minimum energy is because they were produced by the pion itself, right? So they're at least picking up the energy, which is essentially the rest mass of the pion, which is about 135 uh, GeV, giga electron volts. If, if this effect is correct, you would expect to see the, uh, the f a sort of drop in the number of photons at around 150, 130 GeV, you would, because basically you're not producing them from these pion decays anymore. And so that's what they look for, and that's what they saw. So not the end of the story, Brady. It's, so we say we may, so maybe, okay, we think this is where, it looks like this is where these high energy guys are coming from. Is it the end of it? But there is another mystery, and that's that there's something called the GZK cutoff, and this basically says that there should be a maximum energy that any high energy cosmic ray could have, right? Now, it's about 50 million TV. Now remember, I said there were ones about 300 million TV, so it's a little, it's not hugely more, so one could say it's a bit blurry, but... It's like six times more. Well, yeah, but six times in cosmological terms isn't so bad, is it? So, so it's a little bit more, but the, the, okay, so the, why is there a maximum amount that we expect, right? The reason is you take one of these very high energy protons, and it, if it's going at sufficiently high energies, it will start to interact with the uh, cosmic microwave background radiation itself, right? And you can get a process whereby, again, pions, the proton interacts with the cosmic microwave background photons. You produce a pion, and so you lose your energy into these pions. Okay, and then they decay into other photons. But, but the point is the protons themselves would lose energy into these pions. So you basically get a, reach a maximum where you say, right, if the proton's got too much energy, it will just start losing them into pions, and end of story, you, stop, you shouldn't see anything above that scale. But we do see some. Uh, is it really a mystery? Well, you know, I think, I think the jury's still out on that, but it's certainly an interesting question.